This is episode 8 in our Apollo Guidance Computer Restoration Saga. In the last episode, we abandoned the idea of repairing our memory module after testing it. I mean, that module X-ray looked pretty bad. Well, not quite that bad, but still. Seriously, the fault is located deep inside the folded mat and we can't get to it without destroying it completely. Weaving a new 4K module of this odd design without the considerable tooling and test equipment it required is out of the question. So we are exploring alternate plans and most involve plugging new modules into the AGC, so the first problem we face is uh, making new connectors. Unfortunately, the connector system on the AGC is equally very odd and exceedingly rare. It's called the Malco Mini Wasp and was not used in much else than Apollo and the Polaris missile. Our first breakthrough was finding the original drawings for the contacts in the government archives at NARA about a few months ago. The second breakthrough was getting the sponsorship of Samtech, the company I work for when I am not goofing around repairing old computers. I work in fiber optics, but Samtech is mostly known as a major electrical connector company. The custom connector division volunteered to tool and manufacture an exact reproduction of the Apollo contacts. So last December, during a visit to headquarters in Indiana, I checked up on the engineering progress with Andrew. And here we have Andrew, I am filming Andrew, uh, and he's redoing the uh, Malco contacts for the AGC. Yeah, so what we have here is the mated assembly. So this, this is a weird contact. I don't, we never found it anywhere else okay. than on, on the uh, Apollo thing. Maybe it was used on the... Uh, oh, there you go. You, you, you see the... So, so maybe, maybe it was used in, in other uh, military stuff. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a tuning fork kind of design, right? With the pin that goes straight in the middle. Right. It's definitely a very different design than what are like more modern tuning forks yeah. are. Well, I think that's at, at the time what they liked was it's called the mini mini wasp is that they could make arrays of it of any shape and size. And the, the, the AGC, the Apollo computer was by far the densest thing that was ever made Okay. Is, as far as computers. So they, they needed those. What, what happens is that you, you press the, the little housings are they just go one by one and then you can group them in arrays. Mm -hmm. So you're going to do the individual uh, housings basically and we use them like the original contacts. And, uh, Correct. That'll be super cool. So what you see here, we're going to set up a prototype mold. Basically get, uh, it's a four cavity version, so we're going to have two cavities dedicated to this part here and two cavities on this part here. And basically pump out 2,000 of them. Oh, we should show the original design because we, we got the original design from the from the NASA archives. Oh yeah, the and, we, and then we had to go after them because they had never they, they never scanned them, so we had to find a part number and then uh, mm. pay for the scanning. Yeah, that was really cool being able to open up a drawing and see NASA manned spacecraft at the bottom right corner. That's a few. Yeah, so. There you go. so we have all the original dimensions of the darn thing. Mm -hmm. That was when we got that one. We were just jumping up and down. Because <laughs> <laughs> to, redoing the contacts seemed like uh, impossible if we didn't have the original drawing. But yeah, we did. I yeah. spent a few hours basically just going off these drawings, yeah. trying to figure out exactly where all these little lines go. And, and it's, uh, it's, it says MIT. Oh, MIT Instrumentation Lab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's Draper Lab. That's that's the guy that developed the computer. So that was definitely made specifically for the computer. Where do you see NASA on it? Um, I didn't see oh, NASA. Oh, you see where Man Spacecraft Man, Center? Yeah, Man Spacecraft Center. Houston, right Texas. Here. I right. thought that was really cool. See that in the title block. Uh, yeah, that's the original stuff. Mm -hmm. And they went look at. They went through. These are all the revisions. A to U. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and a cool one is that. It's, it has an ungodly amount of gold on it, 50 micro inches. And uh, well, we're not going, to, not going to skip, we're going to put the 50 micro inches. For sure, we're going to barrel plate it. Oh wow, cool. Well thanks Andrew, we appreciate it greatly. You're welcome Mark. 
And while we wait for the contact, Carl's disk is progressing by leaps and bounds from its first scary test incarnation to a clean PCB version, thanks PCB way, to a prop that looks almost like the original, right down to the little white dots on the simulated EL screen. By the way, there is a real disk key for sale at auction this month. We'd really appreciate it if one of you spent the measly $60,000 and lent it to us. Also, I'd be very surprised if it didn't go for much higher than this. In other news, we also hear through the grapevine that Ken is still finding bad contacts from his dipstick modules in the rope emulator. He thinks it's a terrible prototyping method and does not believe the period marketing wonk about the system. Dipstick appears to make a difference, but in the wrong direction. But some of the most amazing progress was made by Mike, which continues to come up with impressive feats of FPGA wizardry. He decided to make an FPGA replica of what was called the monitor. It's that blinking light panel you can see here on the right. Yes, indeed, the HGC was a blinking light machine, just not when you flew it. The monitor connects to the rectangular test connector on the AGC at the right here. Originally, it was mostly done to step the computer for debug and inspect registers, but also it could simulate rope memory. However, after much difficulty, Mike was able to extend it to simulate core memory and also connect it to a virtual disk key. So Mike has been hard at work in between the, your, your satellite uh, shifts, I guess. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, tell us what you got. So this is an implementation of the AGC monitor uh, in an FPGA. The AGC monitor was their test rack that they used at MIT. Uh, it was a fairly sophisticated debugger. Uh, let them you know, do the, all the basics of single-stepping instructions and whatnot, but they could also break point when like, a particular type of instruction gets this value from this register at this time and set a breakpoint there. So on the right, you have a software blinking light, the, yep. co the control panel, and on the left, you have the disk key. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to uh, pan to your hardware box. And you have two FPGAs? Yes. The test connector is 144 pins. Uh, the monitor is using 120-ish of those. Uh, so there's a lot of connections between these two boards. So, so you, you have to explain maybe that the, um, backtrack a second, the, those are two FPGA boards, yep. one is implementing an AGC, that's your famous yep, AGC and an FPGA that started the whole you know, thing of us looking at the real AGC, mm -hmm. and then the second one uh, emulates the, the monitor, so there were some electronics in the monitor, it was a computer, or what was the real one? It's all, all the functionality here is, you know, completely accurate to the original monitor. Um, so it's a... Uh, so it, it is, emulates the hardware that would have been the monitor and right. more, right? Yes, yeah. Okay. And can you, can you make it wiggle? Yeah, so let me turn on my AGC. The monitor is running right now. If I turn on the AGC... And that, that would connect, the monitor would connect in that special monitor port. Oh! Yeah, hey, it's blinking. Wow. So are you running an actual program? I am. You're I'm in, in P00, in Poo, <laughs> right? <laughs> yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm running Aurora 12, the yeah, Lunar Module System Test Rope. Uh, what's Aurora 12? This is the Lunar Module System Test Rope. Uh, so they, they kept a copy of Aurora at the Cape and okay. various places. They would plug that into the ADC when they were doing like full system tests. Okay. Um, so that's a diagnostic program? Yes. Right. So the, the first thing generally you always want to do is inhibit alarms because as soon as you stop the processor, all okay. of the TC trap alarms and Roblox alarms, they all go off. So that's that's always the first button to click. Uh, but now I'm going to I'm gonna do a NISC stop, which is new instruction stop. So I've uh -huh. stopped execution in between instructions. Uh, uh -huh. I can single step through instructions now by clicking the proceed button. As long as I have this stop selected, uh -huh. I can then you know, unselect the stop and proceed and it'll start running again. No, it's a hardware version of a software debugger that we have today where you can mm -hmm. know, peek and poke at the memory, yeah. right? And do set points, yeah. uh, break points and single stepping. 
mm -hmm. and this kind of stuff. Yes. Actually, where we are on it, one of the <coughs> things I like with uh, control panels is that you can they kind mm -hmm. of expose the architecture of the computer. Mm -hmm. Uh, so maybe you can take us through every one of the registers and tell us what, what it is. Uh, so A is the accumulator, the main register for, for processing. Uh, L is the lower accumulator, which is used mostly for temporary storage, but it, its design functionality is that for division and multiplication, it makes a double precision word. Right, so because the multiplication result is twice as big, right. yeah, and the division input is twice as big, exactly. right? Okay. Yep. Uh, Z is the program counter. Okay. So it always points to the next instruction. So this is your king register to follow what the computer is doing, right? Yep. Uh, G is the memory buffer register. So anything that comes in from core memory or rote memory uh, is written into G. And anything that you want to be written out to core memory, you put into G at is the right time. Is that what you hooked up into when, when you did the big FPGA hack last time? Yes. Right. Yep. Yeah, the sun sample fire lines that I, I wired my FPGA into feed directly into G. Right. Uh, so we had the big octopus. Mm -hmm. uh, so then there's the W register, uh, and that can be a whole lot of things. Uh, I'm guessing they probably would have normally had W set up to look at Q. Uh, Q was the return address register, um, and also used for temporary storage. Okay. And then you can also set it up to be uh, the B register, which is the buffer register. Um, B stores the instruction in between uh, memory cycles. Uh, and then you can also set it to be the Y register, which is one of the two adder inputs, and the U register, which is the adder output. Let's see, so then, then the next row of lights here is S, which is your address. Um, so this one has more bits. Yeah. Uh, S itself is only 12 bits long, uh -huh. but then they've also included in S uh, the fixed bank ad, uh, register. All, all the banking stuff, the fixed, right? The to fixed ex extension. To extend bank. your address when you are out of bits, that's yep. what you do. And then the erasable bank. Um, okay. So those are another 10 bits on top of that. Right, which makes sense, right? They are mm -hmm. to define the address of the memory location. Yep. And then uh, the S1 and S2 are not registers, but comparators. So you, you have two different rows that you can use to set addresses for breakpointing and things. So those are little buttons. Yep, that these are said. all all switches. Okay. Uh, then the I, it is uh, so all of these lights here are status bits. So uh, there's things like is an interrupt in progress, or interrupts currently inhibited, is a counter increment okay. in progress, all of that sort of thing. Uh, the SQ register, which is the current instruction. Then there is the stage registers, which show you which stage of the instruction you're at, and then the branch registers, which show you know. Okay, which so, so, so that's that the control guts of the machine. Yep. Right. This row of buttons here is for uh, instruction breakpointing. So if you want to set a breakpoint when an interrupt is in progress or you know when a particular type of instruction is executed uh, or something like well, that. You really made it good. And then the other ones are alarms. Uh, yeah, these are, these are all inhibits for various things, mm. inhibiting interrupts, counters, uh, alarms. Um, and then these are all the options for stopping the computer, mm -hmm. which is, can be um, you know instructions or S1 or S2, or and then there's also a, a, like this panel down here is for um, manual inspection of memory or uh, loading of memory. Or the, the peek and poke. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, that's a pretty impressive and comprehensive panel. So, like a, a really simple example of that is if I set up my S1 register here. Um, to be 10, and my W is zero right now. So uh, when you're when you're loading stuff, um, the S registers are the address you're loading to, and W is what you're writing to them. Okay. Uh, so if I set up my uh, S register to be 10, and I set this bit of W to be one. If I do a preset channel load, I've just written a blank to these two uh, digits on the disky. Manually. Okay, cool. Can, can you can you do it again? Yeah, I'll uh, just see if I can get a zero there. Well, you, uh, I think that should work. You, you know the code for a zero by heart? <laughs> I do. Gee wee. Uh, preset channel? Yeah, there we go. Oh, okay. So I... 
We can, it, it, it does all the relay decoding logic, so if you give it something that doesn't make any sense, it should. There we go. We've got two horizontal lines. <laughs> so this will show what, what you know, the, the, the relays of the disky would decode the segments to. Wow, okay. Pretty cool. So we hope that we can hook <laughs> that up to the real AGC and we'll get some insight of how it's working, right? That's going to be our primary interface. Yeah. Right. But Mike did not just stop there. Uh, to hook it up to the real AGC and not uh, just an FPGA emulation of one, you need a board to adapt the signal levels, provide the power, and interface with the AGC test connector. This is a design he came up with. Uh, we also need to machine a connector plate and it will plug into the AGC. We plan to machine a full enclosure, uh, so it will eventually look like a legit AGC module. So we'll have lots of machining work in perspective. See you then. So we just got another one of our favorite packages from PCBWay and this one should be a board for Mike and hopefully that will work and allow us to run real programs on the AGC.